Webster was kind of an indication of what the Senate was all about. And I still stand by that. The Senate, of course, with two senators for, from each state, regardless of their population, is an opportunity for smaller states and minorities to be represented and to have a voice. And the filibuster, in at least some respects, was a procedural a reflection of that same value. But I would say to Senator Cornyn, I have been moved and changed my mind somewhat on filibuster because of nothing. Nothing. That's what's been happening on the floor of the United States Senate. Nothing. When Senator McConnell, as the Republican leader, was in charge of the Senate over the last two years, we did little or nothing. I didn't run for this office to represent the people of Illinois and to help our nation to watch the ink dry on documents that are being pushed back and forth on desks here. We came here to do something. Two years ago, because of the filibuster, two years ago, we considered 22 amendments in the course of one year on the floor of the Senate. It's not counting votorama, that contraption of a procedure where we debate all of two minutes before we vote on something, but real debate and real amendments, 22. Well, the following year, 2020, dramatic increase. We went all the way up to 29 amendments in the course of a year. You say, well, it, give me some measurement in history. My wife said, what does that mean? In the first year of the Obama administration, we had 240 amendments the first year. Now we're down to 22 and 29. Why? Because we've reached a point now where everyone assumes that every issue is going to be filibustered, and therefore, if you don't have 60 votes, forget it. Well, it's rare that that kind of supermajority shows up on anything important. That's what happens when you play out the filibuster tradition to an extreme. As one staffer said to me today, the Senate is in a death spiral. No one can bring anything to the floor that might be subject to a filibuster because you can't imagine where you're going to get 60 votes. I hope he's wrong, but I can understand his analysis. The measures that we've considered so far this year in the United States Senate, after two months plus, well, the impeachment trial, that didn't require any filibuster votes. The nominations that come before us every day, not subject to a filibuster, and of course, the reconciliation bill, the American Rescue Program from President Biden. That was under a procedure where you couldn't use a filibuster. So now things are quiet on the floor of the Senate again this week and next week because whatever you bring here is subject to a threat of a filibuster and you need 60 votes. I have watched this play out on an issue near and dear to my heart. It's called the DREAM Act. I introduced it 20 years ago, 20 years ago. It basically says if you were brought to this country as an infant, toddler, or child, your parents made the decision, you grew up here and you ought to have a fighting chance to earn your way to legal status and citizenship. That's it. Overwhelming majorities of people in all political parties support it. They think it's a good idea. And you say, Durbin, you came here to be a legislator, and in 20 years you can't pass one bill? Well, I tried. Five times I brought the DREAM Act to the floor of the United States Senate and was stopped with a filibuster each and every time. I got a majority. I still have a majority in support of it, but I can't get that 60 vote, that magic 60 votes that's needed under a filibuster. Well, I'm frustrated by that, and I hope my frustration is manifest by what I've said on the floor. My challenge to the members of the Senate on both sides of the aisle is very simply this. If you believe in the filibuster, if you believe it'll work, Show me that you can pass an important bill subject to the filibuster. Do it next week, the week following. Bring something to the floor, let's debate it, let's amend it, let's vote. I don't think that's unreasonable to ask. In fact, I think that's the reason we were elected to come here. So I'd say to the defenders of the filibuster, try to defend what's happened on the floor of the Senate the last two years. Almost nothing. We can do better. The American people expect it of us. Madam President, I ask that the Next statement I make be placed at a separate part in the record. Without objection. Madam President, last night near Atlanta, Georgia, a gunman murdered eight people in what appears to be an act of domestic terrorism. Six of the eight victims were women of Asian descent. We mourn the lives of those lost and pray for their families and loved ones. 
While local and federal authorities are still investigating the gunman's motives, we know that in the past year it has been a perilous time for Asian Americans and those from the Pacific Islands, especially women. Since the pandemic began last March, nearly 3,800 hate incidents targeting these Americans have been reported. I expect the number of unreported incidents is much higher. Asian American women have had racist insults shouted at them from across streets. Grandparents have been assaulted and killed while running errands. Some Asian Americans have even begun carrying pepper spray, wearing body cameras, walking in groups to protect themselves from wanton violence. Increasingly, AAPI Americans do not feel safe in their own neighborhoods. This palpable fear is proof of how dangerous racist stereotypes and demagoguery can be. When former President Trump insists on calling the coronavirus the China virus, as he did again last night on Fox News, he's not simply spouting hateful, childish rhetoric. He's granting people permission, permission to target neighbors and fellow citizens, permission to hate. This kind of language divides and preys on fears. It offers the kind of answer to every problem that you might expect from these people. There's always somebody you can fear and someone you can hate. The sad reality is that racist fear-mongering has always been a part of the American story. Today, we know by testimony from the FBI director, it is a growing danger to every American. Intelligence analysts warn us that white supremacists and other far-right extremists are the most significant domestic terrorism threat facing the United States. Of course, we look across the ocean to the threat of terrorism after 9-11. But sadly, now we have to look across the street. For too long, the federal government has failed to adequately address this growing threat. We saw the lethal results of that inattention on January 6th, right here in this Senate chamber. Groups of far-right nationalists and neo-Nazis, provoked by former President Trump, stormed our Capitol in an attempted insurrection. I've introduced a bipartisan bill in the Senate that would give law enforcement the resources to address this threat. It's called the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act. It would establish offices to combat domestic terrorism in the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security. Those offices would assess the domestic terrorism threat regularly so that law enforcement can focus their limited resources on the most significant threats, like those facing AAPI Americans today. My bill would also provide training and resources to assist state, local, and tribal law enforcement in addressing those threats. I'm sure the communi communities across this nation could use that support. And there's the issue of how these terrorist acts are committed. Last night's attack near Atlanta was a mass shooting, a uniquely American threat. Next week, the Senate Judiciary Committee, which I chair, will hold a hearing on gun violence in America. Too many people get shot in America, not just near Atlanta, but in the city of Chicago, St. Louis, all across our country. How many times have we seen images in those communities like we did last night of another mass shooting. America is better than this. We need to take action to reduce the number of gun deaths in this nation. We're going to get to work in the Senate Judiciary Committee to try to find some common bipartisan ground to address it. Maybe we will fail. I hope we succeed. We've got to try. It's time for the Senate to stop cowering before any special interest group and pass common sense gun safety policy to the people of Atlanta, to members of the AAPI community, all across America, we are standing with you. We are grieving with you. We'll do everything in our power to protect you. Madam President, I ask the statement I'm about to make be placed in a separate part in the record. Without objection. Madam President, our nation is, a, is at a critical moment in our fight against COVID-19. We see declining infections, declining hospitalizations and deaths, and thanks to three effective vaccines and perhaps more on the way, adherence to social distancing and mask wearing, this new administration has put together a comprehensive plan to address and defeat this virus. 
but we aren't out of the woods yet. In the United States, we have less than 5% of the world's population and 20% of the COVID cases and deaths. We can continue to see 50 to 60,000 new COVID cases every day. We still have approximately 4,700 people hospitalized because of COVID in the United States. We still tragically lose 1,200 American lives each day. While access is improving greatly, we still see too many people struggling to get a vaccine. If we're going to defeat this virus once and for all, we need our top public health officials in place on the job. Yet, our Republican colleagues continue to block the nomination of Javier Becerra to head the Department of Health and Human Services, the chief federal agency responsible for public health response to COVID. Their campaign to leave the top public health position in this nation empty in the midst of a pandemic is unwise. It has to come to an end. It's been three months, three months since President Biden announced that he would nominate Mr. Becerra to serve as Secretary of Health and Human Services. A majority of senators support his nomination. I do. He's a personal friend, someone I've known for years, extremely competent, ready for the job. Yet Republican senators continue to delay Javier Becerra's nomination day after day after day. Their objections to him are all over the map. They say they oppose him because of his support for the Affordable Care Act. Remember that one? President Obama's Affordable Care Act that took half of the people who were uninsured in America and gave them the protection of health insurance, many for the first time in their lives. It provided health coverage to more than 20 million Americans. It's been a lifeline to families nationwide. Most people would say, thank goodness, Mr. Becerra supported it. For a man who wants to be Secretary of HHS, we would almost insist on that. And yet Republicans oppose his nomination because of that. And they also don't like the fact that he was the Attorney General of California and he enforced the state's COVID-19 rules. How can defending public health rules disqualify a person who wants to be the America's top public health official? We're in the midst of a lethal pandemic that has claimed nearly 530,000 American lives. More people infected and dying every day. Is this any time to play politics with the Department of Health and Human Services? I don't think so. Javier Becerra is an effective manager, a smart, thoughtful, passionate leader. He's the right person to lead the department. He served in the U.S. House of Representatives for more than two decades. As California's top prosecutor since 2017, he took on the tobacco companies and the opioid manufacturers. Three cheers for him in both instances. And he helped defend health care for families, women, and the LGBTQ community. In his confirmation hearing, Mr. Becerra highlighted his commitment to serve all Americans by expanding access to health insurance, lowering prescription drug prices, improving rural health care, and addressing racial and ethnic disparities in care. Would you expect anything less from a man who wants to lead our public health effort? When he's finally confirmed this week after this unconscionable delay, and he will be confirmed, He'll be the first Latino to serve as Secretary of HHS. His historic confirmation will be especially meaningful at this moment in time, when Latinos are disproportionately affected by the medical and economic impact of COVID. Delaying his confirmation only hurts our nation, still struggling to beat this pandemic, still working to get everyone vaccinated, to get our schools open, and everybody back to work. Sadly, these Republican senators who have led this charge against him are demonstrating obstructionism at its worst and at the worst moment. I look forward to confirming Javier Becerra to be Secretary of Health and Human Services. I yield the floor. While uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Durbin, is here, 